You're listening to TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour with your host, the director of Dixie Heritage, Dr. Ed DeVries. If you're one of our regular listeners, then you were tuned in a couple of weeks ago when our guest was investigative journalist Pat Shannon. Of course, uh, you probably remember from that interview that uh, Pat had a journalism career that spanned over four decades. And it's really hard to cram four decades of reporting into an hour radio broadcast. And so we just scratched the surface on some of the big stories that Pat Shannon had covered over the years. But we said we'd have him back, and we're doing that today. Pat, once again, will be our guest, and we're going to talk about uh, John Wilkes Booth. We're going to talk about Sirhan Sirhan. We're going to talk about the Kennedy assassination. Uh, did you realize that both Presidents Nixon and Bush were in Dallas at the time of the Kennedy assassination? And afterwards, neither one of them could recall having been there. Of course, there's been a lot of cloud of controversy surrounding the Kennedy assassination for a number of years. Pat's going to try to pull the cloud back for us just a little bit. Also, uh, talk about how Sirhan Sirhan, it was later determined, was actually under hypnosis when he shot Bobby Kennedy. Uh, just some interesting things that we're going to discuss we're going to discuss uh, some other major news events uh, that have taken place over the last 30 years as well, and some of the aspects of those stories that did not get reported by the mainstream media. And so I think you're really going to enjoy today's program. And so what I'm going to do now is, without need of any further introduction, I'm just going to take us straight into our interview with investigative journalist Pat Shannon. You had mentioned that uh, LBJ had made a shocking admission of assassination involvement to his mistress. Johnson knew too much, and, and it, we don't even have to take the words of Lyndon to see the role that he played. And I don't, I don't think he had any of the planning, and the CIA was tending to that. And I don't think Johnson was smart enough to do that anyway. But he certainly was instrumental and a great necessity in the cover-up by his being president. And, of course, he... He handpicks the Warren Commission, and a couple of them who, who weren't too excited about going on, he actually grabbed a couple of them by the collar, one of them being, I think, Richard Russell, senator from Georgia. Actually, you know, yelled at him and manhandled him. But anyway, he, he, of, of all people, he, he picks Alan Dulles. Well, Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA that probably was the brains of the Kennedy assassination because JFK had fired him. And... They, uh, he had all the motive to want to get rid of the president, and certainly when it became a, a big enough deal for the whole CIA to be in on it, he was a nat natural choice. He was the brains of the operation, and here Lyndon Johnson appoints him on the Warren Commission to be sure the cover-up maintains. Well, I've wondered if the Kennedy assassination wasn't some kind of an induction to some Well, as one figure. astute writer said, it was the day that America lost her innocence, November 22, 1963, and uh, of course, you not being around then, you you couldn't see the change, but I saw it. I, I was 23 at the time, so old enough to, uh, to to see what's going on, but just not old enough to know better yet. And uh, you know, I think you got to be about. It. I was in my 40s before Tupper Saucy came along with the miracle on Main Street and uh, began to educate me on the money issue. It seems like we we have to get to be about 40 or so in this mm -hmm. world and day to to start putting things together. And the source for this is. I'm going to polarize my audience when I say the source is questionable. But Alex Jones is the source of this. Okay. The older I get, the the more I begin to question Alex Jones. But that's that's another conversation for another day. Um, yeah, well, many do. I understand. But if Alex Jones is correct, both Richard Nixon and George W. Not George W. George H.W. Bush were on the grassy knoll on the day of the Kennedy assassination. Oh, yeah. Well, now, he, now he's mistaken. Nixon had already flown back to New York. But, yeah, we got pictures of George there standing on the street. Uh, in fact, it's in, it's in uh, my uh, two Oswalds book, Harvey and Lee. Uh, but, the, uh, by the way, John Armstrong did all that great research on, on the Harvey and Lee. I, I give him credit. I have the Reader's Digest version of his thousand-page epic classic of Harvey and Lee. But mine's like only 150 pages or so, discernible. <laughs> but Armstrong did a remarkable job on what so many of us suspected already, 
that there were there was a Harvey and there was a Lee, but it was up until the nineties when when uh well Bob Roden had written a little bit about it. Jim Mars and I, I we just had touched on it, but none of us had really done the research that John Armstrong did. And when he when he did, I was just flabbergasted with Harvey and Lee and come he, he put that book out about two thousand. By twenty thirteen I was uh, sharing a table with Jim Mars in Dallas at the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy deal at one of those big expos. Somebody asked me, you know, about that, and I said, "Well, you can, you can get the, you can get John Armstrong's Harvey and Lee, the thousand pager, for about 400 bucks, or you can pay 20 bucks and get the Reader's Digest version here." But I was, I told people, and I've said it on the air before, that my book was not inspired. My book was provoked. I was angry by 2013 that people are supposed to be on our side, and I'm talking about Jesse Ventura and Jerry Corsi and some of the people that are, you know, allegedly writing these great exposés or the behind the scenes of the Kennedy assassination, and they still talk about a singular Oswald. Well, it's so obvious to anybody that does a little bit of reading on the subject, even my Reader's Digest version is sufficient to see that indeed there was a Lee Harvey Oswald born on October the 18th, 1939 in New Orleans, New Orleans of all places, one of the most distinguishable American accents anywhere, the Cajun. And at age 17, Lee Harvey Oswald in 1956 drops out of high school, joins the Marines, goes to Japan, allegedly spent six weeks in language school, and came out speaking Russian so fluently that by the time he went to Russia and met Marina in 1959, I think he met her in 60, he was speaking a language so fluently that she thought he was a native. Now, that's what got my attention way back in about 66 when I, when I learned that. It's ridiculous when you see, we even got pictures of the two mothers, uh, Lee's mother, who was far more attractive than the Marguerite that the world learned to know after Harvey was killed, but Harvey's mother was uh, the one, that, only one that we ever knew from the news. But uh, we gave me out pictures. And, and by the way, Harvey's mother was a good, I think, 15 years older than Lee's mother. And it's obvious in the pictures. The, I mean, the discrepancies go on and on and on. And we even got to have a witness who just died a couple of years ago. But he and Harvey were in high school together in 57. October the 4th, I believe it was, was the day they launched, the Russians launched Sputnik. And that was a big deal then in the news because, holy smokes, the Russians are getting ahead of us. They're going to go to the moon. And more fear-mongering put out by the media during the Cold War. On that day, McBride was this man's name. He's in my book, forget his first name. But Mr. McBride and Harvey Oswald were discussing the fact that the Russians had launched the Sputnik and they spent a great time on Harvey was... Harvey was quite of a quite an intellectual. Lee Lee was bigger and stronger and uh, and actually a street fighter. Harvey was not. Harvey was kind of a wuss, but nevertheless very intellectual, very well read. And of course, he spoke fluent Russian because he's the one that went to Russia. And McBride were there together, and that was was the focus of his memory. He knew that he was with Harvey Oswald in October of '57. But Lee had gone to Japan and the Marines the previous year in 56. <laughs> so the evidence just becomes over and over, uh, jumping out various different ways. So how was Lee Harvey Oswald uh, actually framed for for the Kennedy assassination? I mean, you, I know you've kind of talked about how there were two different Oswalds. I mean, it's obvious that things didn't happen the way the Warren Commission would have us to believe that it happened. You know, unless you write magic bullets and so forth. But how exactly did they frame everything on Oswald? Well, Lee, of course, was was a CIA, FBI payroll, this sort of thing. He was he he was controlled. I think Lee was more CIA, and Harvey was a FBI drawing the FBI check, and they got him the job, of course, at the school book depository. But they they looked so much alike that they were brought together in the fifties as kids. They weren't brought together to kill Kennedy. They were brought together for something. Because after the after World War II, and here's this kid who speaks fluent Russian in the 50s, they said, "Wow, we can we can we can use him somewhere." Jim Mars put out a little scenario that made a lot of sense. 
because at that time, Robert Oswald, Lee's older brother, not Harvey's, Lee's older brother, Robert, was already in military intelligence and a uh, young soldier in, in 53, and somehow the supposition would have been that the FBI put out this picture and said, you know, who do we know that looks like this? And he somehow got to Robert Oswald, and he, he said, you know what, yeah, he, he does look a lot like me, but I tell you what, he looks a whole lot more like my little brother. And that very well could have been the scenario that brought the two together. We don't know. We do know that they were brought together in, in mid-50s, like 53, when they he actually were both in junior high school, and uh, and that's when this guy, uh, McBride, knew Harvey, and so many others knew Lee, and uh, when they were shown pictures of Harvey's mother, those who knew Lee said, no, that's, that, that's not Mrs. Oswald. It's over and over and over. So Lee probably... About the time he went into the Marines, and Harvey later followed, a year later, after 57, but it was probably around this time that they were deciding to use them for something. I don't believe, from what my research has produced, until April of 63, seven months prior to the assassination, I don't believe that they had put the, the, act, the, the plan in action yet. That's probably when Harvey went to New Orleans, he was back from Russia. He came back in 62. By the way, Thanksgiving of 62, I digress again, but in Thanksgiving of 62, they had a big family gathering, Fort Worth, and John Pick, who was Lee's half-brother, the firstborn of, of Robert and Lee's mother. John Pick, born in 30, 33, I think, and Robert in 34 or 5, and Lee, of course, in 39. But John Pick was at the family gathering, and... He told the Warren Commission this later, that when he saw who he was told was his brother, saw Lee and shook his hand, he didn't recognize him. It's the same person. And John Pick even told the Warren Commission that, but the, Alan Dulles quickly sidestepped it and got it, got it ditched. So then they actually well, switched, switched Oswalds within their family then? Well, that's what I was getting at, because you see, this whole thing could be solved in a minute by, by getting Robert Oswald's DNA. Of course, he would not cooperate with that, but there are many ways to get it anyhow, you know, out of garbage and stuff. But once, once we had Robert Oswald's DNA, it would only be a matter of going to Harvey's two girls. June is one. In fact, she's been outspoken on the, on the Internet, uh, YouTubes and stuff. She's, she's very much uh, interested in her, her father's case and certainly doesn't buy the, the story. So... She would be cooperative. She would be delighted, I'm sure, to share her DNA to, to prove that indeed Harvey was her brother and Robert was not her uncle. And you know, after after the murder and after Oswald's murder and the whole bit, Candy, of course, was shot on Friday. Oswald was killed on Sunday in the jailhouse, and they both were buried on Monday. Robert Oswald never visited his alleged nieces, ever, because they weren't his nieces. Right. You had mentioned in your book that Jack Ruby wasn't really the one who killed Lee Harvey Oswald. Ralph Sinkew, down in Houston, who put together the Oswald Innocence Project, and he had some interesting pictures. Uh, Jim Mars never believed it. I, I was still on the fence, but he had some very interesting pictures of the of the uh, uh, alleged Ruby shooting Oswald that you've all seen a thousand times. Uh, the haircut in back was not Ruby's haircut, but they did compare it to some pictures he found of an FBI agent who was actually shorter than Ruby. He was only like, like five foot six or something. And it, it made for a very interesting read, but I, I, don't, I neither accept it nor deny it. I just don't know. Jim Mars said, no, nah, no, nah, no way. <laughs> he didn't buy it at all. It would help explain a little bit why Ruby, if, if, he, if he did that, I mean, if he didn't shoot him. But he would he would play the game was because of once again they had too much on him with the, with the mob and everything and of course the mob always promises to get the, get their people out of out of trouble and I, they may have gotten Ruby out of trouble. Let's remember that in January of '67, as I remember, Ruby had gotten a new trial granted because of I, I don't know some technicality. Suddenly he ends up with cancer and he's dead before they can have another trial. So maybe, indeed, the mob did get in there and, and uh, help him by getting a new trial and stuff. 
but they had no control over the CIA. They had to, you know, they could not stop Ruby from getting murdered, if indeed they did inject him. Don't know. Speculation. So how was James Earl Ray basically framed for the assassination of Martin Luther King? Oh, much the same as, as Oswald and others. Uh, Ray was a petty thief, and he had never done harm to anybody. There was no record at all of him anywhere of being any kind of hater of the black race, even though that was painted later by the media. He was in the Missouri State Penitentiary. I, I think it was armed robbery or something. Not, not, it was a felony, but I don't think it was anything any, any stronger than that. But in April of 67, he escapes from Missouri State Penitentiary in the back of a bread truck. And we find out many, many years later that the warden was paid off quite handsomely by the FBI to get Ray out. He uh, obviously had the profile of one that they could use as a patsy. But anyway, he escapes in a bread, uh, bread truck, and his brother, John, who lived in East St. Louis, Illinois, across the river, of course, from Missouri, picked him up. Obviously, that had to, had to have been set up also. How would John Ray have known to be there? And he took him to his house in East St. Louis, and James stayed there about a month before he went on to Chicago, and he, he bought him a, a, a Chry old Chrysler, and I can't remember if the Chrysler was his first or second car, but uh, one of them didn't work, and he got another one and was able to go on to Montreal, where he hooked up with uh, an FBI agent by the name of Raul. Raul was all James ever knew him as. In the time in Chicago, and there was a researcher that I met about 15 years ago who had taken a great interest in King and Ray Case and the Ray Frame. He's dropped out. I'm not going to mention his name because I think he might. All I know is he dropped out of the game a year or two after uh, he and I were corresponding, and, and I think they got to him. I think they frightened him because he was uncovering too many things, and so I'd rather help him maintain his privacy. But he, he's from Minneapolis area. found this 302. A 302 form, you probably know, but the audience may not, is what FBI agents use for every incident, every confrontation, everything they did that day. It had anything to do with any sort of crime. They got to write up a report. It's called a 302. Well, my friend found Freedom of Information Acts, uh, some of the FBI 302s, and here they had James Earl Ray tracking him in Chicago. The, mo the month that he was in East St. Louis, and the next week or two or three he was in Chicago, here are 302s where they're tracking him, and they also had gotten him uh, some new ID with a driver's license that did not match anything that would have been uh, raised, and also had the Missouri State Penitentiary change the escape report to not show him on the they didn't have much of the computers in those days, but in the NCIS, but whatever they had, any any records would not show James Earl Ray as being an escape, escaped uh, prisoner. So if you see, this was in April and May and June of 67, and King wasn't killed until April the 4th of 68. So obviously the FBI was behind this from the very beginning. They were setting him up as a patsy. So he gets to Montreal, and he meets Raul, and Raul uh, befriends him, and they, uh, first, they want to do a test run to, because Raul tells them they're going to be hauling some contraband. Buys him a Mustang, and he drives to the border, and he does a little little test run there and passes the test. He and Raul go to New Orleans. James had a 504 area code, New Orleans area code phone number for Raul, up until the day the king was shot. Then the number was unplugged. But he, uh, Raul sent him to uh, Acapulco. He lay on the beach there for sometime and uh, then he got into Los Angeles because they knew a plastic surgeon out there. James had pointed features and they wanted to round his, round off his nose a little bit and his chin and ears I guess to look more like some of the ID that he was going to be carrying from Canadian citizens. He then they go to um, end of March they go to Birmingham and Raul and from the motel room sends James over to uh, buy hunting rifle. Tell him it's for your brother-in-law. Well, he goes in to the uh, gun store there, Arrow Marine, as I remember was the name of it, and, and he picks out a rifle and doesn't know much about him. The salesman 
recommends this this uh, Remington 270. And James says, okay, that's a good, good deer rifle, huh? Oh, yeah. So it goes back to the motel room with it. Raul says, no, nah, no, nah, that's not large enough bore. We, uh, you got to take it back to market. We need something bigger than that. James says, well, I don't know. Here's a here's a catalog. Pick out what you want. I'll tell him. So he goes back in the next day and says he wants a larger bore, like a 30 out 6 And the salesman says, well, you tell your brother-in-law that that 270 you bought yesterday, it'll bring down any deer in Alabama. That was the quote. And, of course, James picks up the 30 out 6 and pays the difference and goes back. Now, of course, the obvious reason for sending James back is to make doggone sure that that gun salesman is going to remember one James Earl Ray. Right. And, of course, he did. He even remembered, the, he remembered telling him that about his brother-in-law and the deer. Now they went from – this is right at the end of March, and they go to Atlanta. Come to find out, we, it didn't make sense for a long time why they would have gone from Birmingham to Atlanta instead of – come to find out, Martin Luther King was scheduled to go to Miami. He had a speech lined up in Florida that got canceled – because of the garbage collector strike in Memphis. So he changed his plans and turned and went from Atlanta back to Memphis on the 2nd or 3rd of April. And, of course, it was Sunday night the 3rd, I guess, that he made his, his famous speech. And at that time, Ray and Raul had turned around in Atlanta also and had driven to Memphis and put up in that flop house, which was across across the street and up the hill from the Lorraine Motel. Hoover, at the time, J. Edgar Hoover, had actually manipulated the room that King was be renting at the Lorraine Motel because of the civil rights strife at the time. The uh, all-white hotel that he had attempted to book into, I guess he might have even been there before, but they, they rejected him suddenly this time, and they had to go over to the Lorraine, which was right down the hill, 200 feet from the flop house. Now... Raul and Ray are in the flop house on April the 4th, and all day long, Raul tries to manipulate James to do this, that, and the other, and he finally, at 10 minutes to 6, was instructed to go downstairs to a place that's called Jim's Grill and stick up the grill and go down the street, down Main Street there, two blocks, three blocks to the arcade restaurant, and he said, meet me there, and we'll have some travel money. So James leaves his, his duffel bag and stuff, up in the upstairs on the bed he goes out and he doesn't go down to jim's grill and stick it up but he gets in his white mustang and calmly drives away he goes down as he said to a tire dealer and to try to get the tires checked and rotated or wherever on his car and tire dealer said you have to come back in the morning I'm too busy we're getting ready to close at six king is shot at like 602 or three and what is what happens then is two guys one Raul, the FBI agent, scoops up James's duffel bag and runs. Uh, well, excuse me. First, he was in the in the bathroom. He was in the bathroom with the thirty out six. He never fired; just was there as a decoy. And as, as King is shot, he sees it, runs out of the bathroom. Two people see him, Raul, and neither could identify him as Ray. Both said it was not James Earl Ray. One of the women who said that went to the insane asylum for ten years, very quietly, and. I mean, just a day or two later, they just captured her and stole, kidnapped her right off the street. And Raul you know, packs up James's duffel bag, which contains his a beer can with his James's fingerprints, uh, his clothes, book or two, and the prison radio from the Missouri State Penitentiary with James Earl Ray's ID number engraved into the back. He runs down the stairs, expecting to jump in the Mustang and take off. Raul does. Right behind him is a man that we name in the book, and this is a story that very few people know, but the, the guy by the name of Butch Collier, who was a deputy sheriff in Car Carothersville, Missouri, was traveling with uh, my contact, James Green, and he was the one who actually killed King. And that detail is probably more than I want to try to get into today because nobody knows it, it's too, and it's too intricate. Too many people <laughs> have too many questions. But, the, of course, you can read about it in the in the current issue of the Barnes Review, all the details. But anyway, the two of them, the shooter, Collier, had run up the hill with his rifle and run up the stair, uh, stairs and um, going down the stairs right behind Raul. The two of them run out on the street expecting to jump in uh, James's Mustang, and instead it's gone. Well, they had a, 
actually had three white Mustangs. One was kind of a pale yellow. Collier had this one, and they Raul panics and throws that duffel bag in front of the business next door. It's an amusement gaming pinball machine type business. He throws a duffel bag in the with all that evidence in it in front of the doorway, and he and Collier jump in the other Mustang and spin the tires and take off. What the witnesses said was exactly true, that they saw two men come out of there, dump the duffel bag in front of their window, and, and jump in the Mustang and take off. They saw two people. That's because the, the one, the Patsy, had already quietly left and nobody saw him. And this is a, another another piece that the FBI had to patch. Once again, that's in the details in the, in the magazine article. That magazine article that you've referred to twice in the last couple of minutes is, of course, the May-June 2018 issue of PBR Magazine, the Barnes Review Magazine. That was a great issue. It also featured my article on secession and the law of God. I'd like to encourage all of our listeners, if you're not a subscriber to the Barnes Review already, to go to the Barnes Review's website and check out that last issue. And, of course, the Barnes Review is our sponsor for TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour. So we are going to pause here and have just a brief word from the Barnes Review. Then we'll be back with our guest, Pat Shannon. If you love listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, then I know that you'll love reading the Barnes Review. The Barnes Review is one of my favorite magazines. I began reading the Barnes Review long before they became a sponsor here on the program. In the Barnes Review, you will read Vignettes of Man from the prehistoric to the very recent from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There's just not a more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So if you'll visit www.barnesreview.org, that's www.barnesreview.org, you can find out how you too can become a subscriber to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review by mail, or... You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review electronically in PDF editions. Or you can subscribe to receive both. That's what I do. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. We're back with our guest, Pat Shannon. Pat, go ahead and pick up the story where uh, you had to leave off right before our commercial. That's how they set up James Earl Ray. He came back in in his Mustang Oh, five or ten minutes after six, and there were cops all over the place. And he's an escaped uh, prison uh, uh, prisoner from Missouri, so he doesn't have any business hanging around there. Goes out of town and gets on Highway 78, I guess it was, towards Alabama, and he drives to Atlanta. And from Atlanta, he was uh, had some connections. Private plane apparently took him uh, back to Canada out of Charlie Brown Airport there on the west side of Atlanta. Oh. Uh, and that's uh, when he began to uh, use the other ID. Uh, John Willard was one of the names, and he uh, made his way to, uh, of course, to Europe and Portugal. Somehow, for some reason, was lured back into London is when they captured him in London Airport in June. They put him in jail in Shelby County there and literally tor- tortured him. They played music. They left the lights on 24 hours a day, and this is June of of 68, and he didn't try him until March. So that, those were his living conditions at the time. And he was later terrified. He had a, had a criminal defense lawyer by the name of Percy Foreman. James called him Percy Fourflusher. But Percy's the one who talked him in and he apparently got $100,000 for talking Ray into pleading guilty and without, without a trial. They couldn't afford to have a trial in this case. And uh, James withdrew his plea his guilty plea three days later, and there was a judge there in Memphis by the, by the name of Battle. I want to say Preston Battle or Percy Battle. Last name was Battle. Judge Battle, what a name. And Judge Battle was considering Ray's papers when he was found dead at his desk lying on top of James Earl Ray's plea to change his, or motion to change his plea. That's where Battle died. Don't know why, don't know how, don't know if he got a needle or what. But he showed his D. So, so there's a there's the sort of details. So you describe these uh, these plans, whether it be with the King assassination or with the JFK assassination, and they're intricate. And and these sources, these these patsies, if you will, had been worked for a number of years. So do you think that it takes that many years to put everything in place 
to commit the crime, or do you think that they're just grooming these people and then just plug them into whatever crime they they want to commit when they? You know? That's exactly what they do. Uh, and as I said earlier, they they had certainly had no plans to kill President Kennedy in 1953 or 56 or seven, or even in 59 when Harvey went to Russia. Kennedy wasn't even president yet. Right. But they know they will use these guys for something. And Harvey speaking fluent Russian as he did, they had him in the perfect place, especially when he hooks up and marries a, a, a Russian woman who actually had KGB connections through an uncle. So, yeah, so they're, they're sitting on it, and they, they bring him home Thanksgiving time of 62. But as I said, I don't believe the mechanics were put into motion in, until April or, or May of, of 63. Harvey went to New Orleans, and Lee... And Robert, both, were running loose in Dallas, and all kinds of plans were being made then. Tell us briefly about Sirhan, her, uh, Sirhan Sirhan and how they uh, basically were able to pin the RFK assassination on the wrong man again. I'm going to pull that chapter of uh, book, a page out from my book because there's some important, important numbers in that on this question for you to understand. But Sirhan, didn't, uh, he didn't know anything. He was under hypnosis. He was, was the classic patsy. 10 o'clock that night, Kennedy wasn't shot until like 12.30, but it was uh, June the 4th of 68. It was a Tuesday, prime, California primary, and Bobby Kennedy had been a, a latecomer to the, to the uh, race. Uh, Johnson dropped out in March, and I think that's when, when Bobby said, okay, I, make room for me. But he suddenly was the most popular. June the, the 4th, the Tuesday night primary, when they had been declared the winner, Kennedy stood in front of the microphone and thanked him and took his congratulations and said, now let's, now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Chicago, of course, being the place for the Democratic Convention in July. Kennedy, he was assigned to check out the credentials of the doorway of the Colonial Room, where the press conference was to be held. He was Kennedy's press secretary who actually turned him around and directed him to the kitchen toward where Sir Han was. Sir Han carried a Ivory Johnson 8-shot 22 revolver. I knew the gun well because I had one myself. Exactly like it. It was, just, it was a cheap, close-range protection. I was a nightclub entertainer at that time. I had a folk singing trio and get paid off a lot of times in cash on Saturday night. And I just thought it was a good idea to... Uh, you know, travel with a weapon. So I owned the same gun. Now, I was in Australia. I was actually at the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper when the first teletype popped across in the press room there, and I, I tore it off and saved it. I still got it in my scrapbook. But shots rang out in the Ambassador Hotel ballroom tonight uh, where Bobby Kennedy was speaking. That's, that was it. I mean, that was about a, the most initial report that we could get. Uh, Eight-shot revolver. Sir Han didn't empty it. He fired it six times. He was then overcome before he could empty the gun. He was firing wildly, and he never got closer than three to four feet, witnesses said, to Bobby Kennedy walking toward him. And uh, two uh, all-world athletes, uh, Rayford Johnson was the decathlon champion in, in, in Rome in 60, and, and uh, Roosevelt Greer was all-world uh, Los Angeles Rams lineman. They were, of course, big, big Kennedy backers, and and they subdued Sir Han. Either one of them could have done it with one hand, but both of them were on top of him. As I say, Sir Han fired six times and never remembered any of it. He wounded five people. Bobby Kennedy was shot in the back of the head behind the right ear twice. There were four shots that hit him, one through, one through the tuft of his coat, armpit sleeve, and did not wound him, but went into the ceiling above, indicating that it was being fired from below. And another one went into Kennedy's back. And he died uh, 25 hours later. He, he died on, on June the 6th. Uh, and the was actually, you know, they say he was shot on the 5th, but it was, as I said, the night of the 4th, the Tuesday night primary. So that's the way I always remember it. Well, we get to trial. Sir Han tried to fire his attorney. He had a bogus attorney. And those details are in the magazine article again. But he, uh, I, I, I won't try to explain here what, what, what was going on, except this one detail. And this is why I wanted to get the book because there was an investigative reporter back when we still had him by the name of Ted Chirac, who worked for a TV station in Los Angeles. He got some pretty good, uh, good help. I, have, I still have his VHS video here. Uh, his astounding evidence showed the blow-ups of the microscopic ballistic printouts that the bullets removed from Kennedy's body were not fired from the same gun that wounded the other five victims. 
Now, this was not, not Chirac doing it, but it was an expert that he had by the name of William Harper. Dropping down, here's the important part, Ed. Chirac also proves with an interview with the district attorney that a second 22 pistol was fired in the room that night and that it was intru introduced into evidence at trial by the prosecution, no less. LAPD criminologist Dwayne Wolfer testified under oath that he had personally test-fired the weapon, an Ivor Johnson 22 revolver with the serial number, get this, H18602, and had found it to be the weapon that had fired the bullets that had been removed from Kennedy's neck and several other victims. But now here comes the big however. However, the serial number on Sir Hans Ivor Johnson weapon was not H18602, but H53725, and not one member of the defense team caught it. In a complaint to the Attorney General later, Wolfer was accused of suffering from a great inferiority complex for which he compensates by giving the police exactly what they need for conviction, blah, blah, blah. Well, they had just <laughs> thrown egg all over everybody's face. But it goes to show, once again, how the defense for Sir Han was stacked against him uh, because even his defense attorney, you know, doesn't catch something as obvious as that. In fact, I asked uh, four other criminal defense attorneys over the, over the period of time about this when I was writing this book. I said, is there any way that that would have gotten past you? They said, no way. As soon as they read out a serial number in the courtroom, we match it immediately. That, you know, that's what we've got to do. And that was kind of standard operating procedure that I got from all the other attorneys that I, I questioned about it. So more on the details in the Barnes Review article of of what happened with Sir Han, but Sir Han even he himself believed he had done it. He didn't know why he had done it, but it was it was like ten years into the prison, into prison. He was like late seventies before he finally began to realize, and some other lawyers and people convinced him, investigators, that he had not done it, that he had not killed Kennedy. And uh, but as I say, for a decade he believed he had. The evidence that they showed him, of course, uh, proved it. But once again, that's a system framing a man for the, a murder of somebody that they needed to get rid of because there was no doubt that Bobby Kennedy was going to be elected president. Hubert Humphrey was the second best Democrat who ended up getting the nomination, and he almost beat Nixon. So certainly Bobby Kennedy would have swamped Nixon. So why do you think that it was so important to get Richard Nixon elected when he was the same person who, once he was in office, it became so important to get rid of him? Well, I mean, that would almost be I, like, like knocking off Hillary Clinton to make sure that, that Donald Trump became president. You just remind me of something else. Let me backtrack, and, then we'll, and we'll be, I'll be sure to come back to this. But you talked about uh, both Nick, uh, Nixon and uh, George Bush being on the street with the Kennedy assassination. Yes, sir. No, Bush was. Nixon had already been uh, on, was on a plane to New York. But they both had been there the night before at Clint Murchison's house. Do you know the Clint Murchison story? No, sir. Clint Murchison owned the Dallas Cowboys. He was an oil millionaire and when, uh, would be a billionaire today, in today's dollars, but also strong backer of Lyndon Johnson. Can I ask you a crazy Lyndon, question? Did Larry pardon? Hagman play that guy in a movie? Um, if you're talking about that TV series of Dallas, no, that would not have been Murchison. No, sir, there was a movie that was... Uh, I, I that, don't know that then. You, you, you might be right. There was a movie about the Kennedy assassination... And Larry Hagman played uh, played this millionaire who was basically orchestrating the assassination of the current president. And well, that would be Murchison. And then he was trying to he was trying to get a a, a young Republican to um to take his place. Well, yeah, that would be Murchison. Now there was a big meeting at Clint Murchison's house on Thursday night, the twenty first, the night before the assassination. Johnson and Kennedy, of course, are in Fort Worth at a banquet. Madeline Duncan Brown, do you know that name? It's not ringing a bell. Uh, it's in my book on the two Oswalds, we even her picture. She and I became friends because we had met at an expo in 98 in Dallas, book expo, and and she had had her book there, and she I introduced myself, and one because we always trade books on Sunday afternoon before we leave, and, and she says, well, how do you do? I'm, I'm Madeline Duncan Brown. I was, I said, Lyndon Johnson's girlfriend. <laughs> and she smiled. She had given birth to Lyndon's illegitimate son in 1950 and had remained his paramour, among others, of course, whenever died. Lyndon came back to Texas. But she was got a call from Clint Murchison 
that there was going to be a big gathering at the house, and, you know, would she like to stop by? She was kind of a party girl. She knew Jack Ruby. She used to hang out at the carousel. And uh, play, she said she used to play checkers and cards with some of the some of the carousel dancers at Ruby's nightclub and the strippers. And, and I said, did you ever dance there? She's 75 years old now when I knew her. And I said, did you ever dance there? She said, no, but I always wanted to. <laughs> but anyhow, she was she's at the party, and at about 10 o'clock, Lyndon Johnson comes in. And they uh, he ha- he has a drink, and he's angry. And they all of them go into the smoke-filled conference room, not, not Madeline. But Madeline said while she was in there, Jack Ruby stopped by. I said, Jack Ruby, hey, this is getting a little deep now. And she said, no, Jack, he he didn't have anything to do with them except he was their pimp. And Ruby would supply the girls for the big wig politicians when they would come to town. So he came by and dropped off a couple of girls and said hello to Madeline and left. And when they broke up the meeting an, an hour or so later, they all came out and she said Lyndon was steaming angry, and he came up to the to the bar where she was and and said, after after tomorrow, those blankety blank Kennedys will never embarrass me again. He said, that's not a threat, that's a promise, and that's a quote she used verbatim for the rest of her life. He died in about '02, I think, as I remember. Sure enough, uh, I when I got home. Now, I had heard this story about Murchison from somebody else. In fact, it was CIA colonel who had actually flown the what he called was the crossfire assassination team into into Dallas. And he, General Bowen, he became a general. He was a colonel when he was active. But Russell Bowen talked about that meeting, and he said, you know, and this is down in Florida, a different time. I'm digressing here, but I had several great interviews with him. And he says, you know, I get a big kick out of it when the only two guys in the world – who can't remember where they were on the day Kennedy was killed, were George Bush and Richard Nixon. <laughs> and he says, I know where both the lion bastards were. They were with me at Clint Murchison's house. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, that was the first indication I had of the big meeting. But now that was in 94 or 5, and here in 98, I'm learning these things from Madeline, who was also there. And, of course, you know, the good book says, out of the mouths of two or more witnesses. Well, now I got my second witness. And I, I had never written a word about the Murchison thing until Madeline had confirmed it. And so they come out of the meeting and, and, uh, and, and break up. And, of course, everything else has to say is history the next day. So did you ever confirm this story with Madeline after that? Did, did you and her ever discuss the subject again? And just the early pages, she talked about the meeting, and I went. And I got her on the phone, and I I was excited. I said, "Well, the, the Marches and Party were, were, were George Bush and Richard Nixon there." Oh, he had he had said even uh, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger was there, and she confirmed Nixon. But you got we got to remember George Bush and Henry Kissinger, both of them in 1963 were pretty obscure characters. I mean, they were not publicly known or recognizable. So she could not confirm that. But yes, indeed, she confirmed Nixon and too many other people, of course, have placed Bush in town. So he certainly would have been at that meeting at Murchison's house. Okay, well, here's something, just because I've been looking it up, because I'm thinking, you know, my memory has to be, you know, you were talking and it was triggering something. Okay. Do you remember the movie Nixon? The one yeah, where, um, the, the movie where Anthony Hopkins played Richard Nixon. Yeah, Hopkins. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Hey, Larry Hagman played a character in that movie, and the name was Jack Jones. Oh. And here is the tag. Unlike some other characters in the film who represent actual people, Jack Jones, the billionaire investment banker and real estate tycoon, is a composite character and a reference to Nixon's meetings with Clint Murchison. Ah. Okay, there you go. So I I knew when you were telling me that, it's like, I've seen that in the movie somewhere. So that's... So that's the where party. That, did they did they portray the party at Murchison's house in the movie? They did, and and I remember um, I knew I had seen that in a movie somewhere, and, and apparently it was in the movie Nixon. So you know, it's amazing how yeah. sometimes you know uh, how do I say this? They hide the truth in plain sight. <laughs> Anyways, we need to pause here and have a brief word from another one of our sponsors. 
a publication that Pat Shannon many years ago was the editor-in-chief of, the American Free Press. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are because you're listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. You like to hear about the latest financial trends and to know what's happening around the world and right here in the United States, the things that can directly impact you, your life, and the life of your family. And if you're like me, you do not rely on the mainstream media to obtain this information because, frankly, you know that you just can't trust them. Fortunately, there is an alternative news outlet with a long-established track record for honesty and integrity, and that is the American Free Press. AFP is the preeminent alternative independent news source for honest, hard-working, truth-loving Americans. AFP is the antithesis of the controlled, lamestream media. AFP is employee-owned and has been so since its founding. Because of that, AFP never has and never will allow advertisers or special interests or big money to dictate what appears in the pages of the American Free Press newspaper. Twenty-six times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. AFP covers the stories and tells the truth that the lamestream media is frankly scared to touch. And AFP offers real, on-the-scene reporting and commentary, the likes of which you will never see in the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, or just about any other lamestream news source that you can think of. That's right, there's only one national populist news weekly staffed by an unsurpassed team of veteran investigative journalists who will dare to rip the veil off of many of the major news stories, and that's the American Free Press. AFP publishes exciting, in-depth, uncensored news and information that's grassroots and patriotic, information that Americans need to know in order to combat the growing police state. AFP stands firmly against the New World Order and against those who are working to establish a global plantation under the rule of a powerful few. In short, AFP is your voice. If you have any doubt why they want to silence AFP, you must be relying on the lamestream media for your news. And folks, that's a big mistake. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. To kind of kind of turn the conversation a little bit, you had also written about the Lincoln assassination in your book. Well, I have a separate book called "The Great Escape of John Wilkes Booth." It, uh, it, it can be uh, have your audience look at iniworldreport.com in the book section. There, we've got a ninety-nine dollar special that includes the Oklahoma City bombing video. It includes seven other books, and, and this is one of them. It amounts to something like less than half price when they buy the special. But the the Lincoln assassination book is more written about John, about Booth than it, than it is Lincoln because everybody knows what happened at, you know, at Forbes Theater. But the, the Great Escape is something just about impossible to explain on the radio of how Booth escaped, of course, that night and through the woods and he got away to, to California and a lot of people, students of history at least, you know, know that he, he ended up overseas. The d- details they don't know is I came across a book written in 1937 by John Wilkes Booth's granddaughter. She was Isola Forrester and the title is called This One Mad Act and it's all about her grandfather, John Wilkes Booth. Well, we got we got take, Booth, of course, was uh, allegedly killed in '65 in the barn at Garrett's farm, and he. Uh, but instead, he lived. He got to California, and his wife he had a daughter who was uh, five years old. She was born in '60, and the, the wife, of course, and the five-year-old daughter, and who was the mother of the author of the book, the granddaughter, remembered that uh, when she was five, the last time she saw her daddy was when he came by the house and he was on horseback and he had an, uh, one of the slaves uh, with him was his guide, 
her mother handed her to Daddy Booth, and he hugged her and kissed her goodbye and left. Well, in, two years later, in 67, and this is a difficult part to explain. I'm not going to try to get into details except to tell you that, that Booth wife went to California with someone else and hooked up with Booth. And when she returned two years later, I want to say January of 70, when she came back, she had a son with her, a baby. We printed his picture in the Booth book, and it's uncanny how much he looks like his daddy, John Wilkes Sr. This boy had to go by the name of Stevenson. He had a, had a bogus name, of course, uh, but uh, I don't think there's... Anybody could doubt, looking at these two pictures, who, who the real father was. Proving, of course, that John Wilkes Booth was still alive. The last thing, really, would be the murder of NFL football star Pat Tillman. Pat Tillman learned too much. Once again, he was very naive, and uh, he had what we call the red, white, and blue fever. And, and really, I, I remember at the time how foolish I thought he was. And throughout 2002, he, he quits a very lucrative NFL contract, decides to join the army and hook up with his brother and go to Afghanistan. Well, he didn't, he didn't know that the real reason we were in Afghanistan it was to protect the poppy seeds or the Bush family. And the same reason we were in Iraq, to guard the oil and steal it. I tell you, Pat Tillman was no dummy. Unfortunately, I found out he was an atheist, which I say too bad because uh, he, was, he was one of those guys that I've known two or three in my life that that, and I'm sure you've known them too, that they, they were too smart for their own good. And, you know, these, these liberals that reject God uh, out of hand, I think I just say they're too smart for their own good. They, but anyway, that was Tillman's problem. But nevertheless, he was one smart dude. He was very well read. And he paid attention to a lot of stuff going on. His mistake was that he was in touch back in the States with uh, – Oh, what's that leftist name? I'll think of it in a second. Uh, and he was corresponding and was planning to blow the whistle on the Bush family and the Afghanistan ploy. Noam, yeah, Noam Chomsky. No, Noam Chomsky? Recognize that name? He's a big leftist up there in Harvard and around. He and Pat Tillman had been corresponding by mail, and Tillman had told him a lot of the stuff that he had, he had learned about the drug running and Tillman had told Chomsky that he realized too late that he had been sent to Afghanistan to, quote, guard the poppy fields and protect American CIA drug investments for the U.S. banksters, not American freedoms. His mistake, though, Ed, was telling Chomsky that he was going to blow the whistle when he got home. And instead, he got murdered. Obviously, another CIA hit. They, first, they called him a hero, and uh, it's pretty disgusting stuff to read. General Wesley Clark finally told the truth to the family. At first they said, you know, he was a hero, and they gave him the parents of Silver Star posthumously. And then he said, no, no, it was, it was friendly fire accidentally. And then they finally admitted a month or two or three later that he had been shot point blank in the range, probably from 10 feet away, shot, shot right in the, in the face. So it was another rub out. Uh, and because, uh, once again, he, he knew too much. They could not. Well, you know, let's remember, you know, he was George Bush's poster boy for the war. Right. You know, Afghanistan in no way was ever accused about being involved in 911, and yet that's the first place we sent troops as the excuse to go into Iraq later. And it was the Saudis, the only ones who were ever blamed, and uh, we never went into Saudi Arabia. We just went into Iraq and Afghanistan. The whole thing's a joke when you look at the details. Tillman, of course, uh, discovered all this, and, and uh, he no longer was going to be the poster boy for Georgia's war. And, in fact, he was about to become a strong adversary, and that's why he had to be taken out. So tell us, uh, basically, how do we find you on the Internet? How do we find your, your blogs and your articles? And also, how do we find your books? Um, the best place to go for most all of that is INI, which is Independent News International, but INIWorldReport.com. And that will, that will take you to the recent articles. It will take you to the, the mainstream news cover-ups that we try to publish almost every day. And, uh, and do. Then uh, my book list and the book, the book special there, but even if you don't want the $99 special, each of the things we've been talking about today are detailed uh, in there so you can bring them up separately. And, and, um, but that's, that's kind of my forte. I just, I just, I'm a truth teller. I, I like to investigate and report the stuff that nobody else is reporting anymore. But it's uh, INI, World Report, 
dot com. Okay, very good. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, spell all this stuff out for us today. I, do, I don't get to talk this long and this much about all of them. Uh, as, as one one guy told me, I guess it was a, a pretty nice compliment for, a, for somebody such as I as an investigative reporter or trying to still be one. But he said, you know, so-and-so knows all about uh, this this case, and so-and-so, this guy, man, he knows all about that one. He said, but Shannon knows all about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Peter. Yes, sir. But I don't know all about all of them, but I, I have I've paid a lot of attention to many of them. And oh, I remember back in May the uh, May the fifteenth of seventy two when they tried to take out George Wallace, and Arthur Arthur uh, Bremer as well as the Patsy that day was he was the shooter, but he had a six uh, uh, excuse me a five shot Smith and Wesson little Dick Tracy snub nose revolver. Wallace was hit four times in the trunk from his waist to his neck. Miraculously survived. And the next day, the New York Times, May the 16th, 72, look it up. There's a Secret Service agent was uh, shot through the throat. A campaign woman, a campaign or carrying posters and stuff, she got shot in the leg. And Wallace's Alabama Highway Patrol police captain, was Wallace's personal bodyguard, and he took one in the gut. Now, you take four shots in, in Wallace and one each and three other people, four and three make seven. That's a, that's a real fast reloading of a five-shot revolver, wasn't it? Yep. Now, why can't reporters catch this? You know, I, I catch it the first day I read it, ten years later, and, and holy smoke, here it's published right there in the New York Times, and nobody calls attention to it. Well, because they're instructed not to. Why do you think that kind of stuff doesn't even get edited out? I mean, why why, why even report about the extra three shots to other people? Well, why, why, it, why? it will now. And, in fact, I wrote in one of my musings, I think it was this month, and, and oh, recently in, at INI, I was pointing out that in Oklahoma City, for instance, we used to tell people, and that's what really prompted it with me, that whenever something big happens, go turn on your TV and your recorder and get what the reporters are telling live on the street, because they are reporting honestly. And Oklahoma City was the brilliant classic example. Suddenly, there was this uh, soldier boy who had driven a rider truck up in front, and it was filled with ammonium nitrate fuel oil and blah, 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 blah. And so the whole story changed. And so we used to tell people that you just listen to the early reports, because then you're getting the truth. Well, that's not true anymore. We don't get even the early reports aren't true anymore, because the whole scenario is already laid out. The news stories are already planted before the incident ever happened. And sometimes they screw that up. Okay, yeah, the phone's beeping. I better hang up. All right, well, thank you, Pat. Sure, and listen, uh, anytime you want uh, clarification on anything, give me a call. I'll be happy to maybe explain some things that I didn't quite clarify today. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Sure. All okay, right. well, let me know when you get it up and how I, how I link it. All right, yes, sir, I will. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, every time I talk to Pat, I always just get more information that I can process. And, of course, that happened once again today. It's going to take me several days, maybe even a couple of weeks, to absorb all of this information. I hope that uh, you not only got an earful, but also got a brain full that you could be processing uh, for the next few days as well. At least be processing it until uh, this time next week when you join us again for the next episode of TBR Radio Presents, the Dixie Heritage Hour. Until then, uh, make sure to visit INI World Report. Dot com, INIWorldReport.com. That's the depository of all of Pat Shannon's reporting over the decades. And also, make sure to go to www.dixieheritage.net. While you're there, sign up for a free copy of our weekly newsletter, the Dixie Heritage Letter. You'll receive that at no cost and no obligation. And when you sign up for it, I'll even throw in a free copy of my book, The Truth About the Confederate Battle Flag. You might also want to go to the BarnesReview.org website. Our sponsor, the Barnes Review, has another issue coming up here uh, in just a few short weeks. It will be the July-August issue, and it is jam-packed, and you will not want to miss it. There are some very hard-hitting articles in there that you'll definitely want to read. Of course, uh, for all of us here at TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour, uh, we want to thank you for being one of our faithful listeners 
And we ask that you send us an email. Let us know who you are. Let us know how you're listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour. And uh, let us know if there's anything uh, in particular that's of interest to you. Maybe, just maybe, uh, we can do a show on it. And maybe you've written a book. Uh, maybe you're involved in some event and you would like to get some exposure for us. Let us know. Maybe we'll have you as a guest on the Dixie Heritage Hour. Until next week, God bless.